Catechism of the Council of Trent, the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The importance of explaining this petition. So many are the things which display at once God's infinite power and his equally infinite wisdom and goodness that wheresoever we turn our eyes or direct our thoughts we meet with the most certain signs of omnipotence and benignity and yet there is truly nothing that more eloquently proclaims his supreme love and admirable charity towards us than the inexplicable mercy mystery of the passion of jesus christ whence springs and that never failing fountain to wash away the defilements of sin. It is this fountain which, under the guidance of bounty of God, we desire to be merged and purified when we beg of him to forgive us our debts. This petition contains a sort of summary of those benefits with which the human race has been enriched through Jesus Christ. This Isaiah taught when he said, The iniquity of the house of Jacob shall be forgiven, and this is all the fruit that the sin thereof should be taken away. David also shows this, proclaiming those blessed who could partake of that salutary fruit. Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. The pastor, therefore, should study and explain accurately and diligently the meaning of this petition, which we perceive is so important to the attainment of salvation. Difference between this and the preceding petitions in this petition, we enter on a new manner of praying for hitherto we asked of God not only eternal and spiritual goods, but also transient and temporal advantages, whereas we now ask to be freed from the evils of the soul and of the body of this life and of the life to come, dispositions with which this petition should be offered. Since, however, to obtain what we ask, we must pray in a becoming manner, it appears expedient to explain the disposition with which this prayer should be offered to God. Acknowledgement of sin. The pastor then should admonish the faithful that he who comes to offer this petition must first acknowledge and next feel sorrow and compunction for his sins. He must also be firmly convinced that to sinners thus disposed and prepared, God is willing to grant pardon. This confidence is necessary to sinners, lest perhaps the bitter remembrance and acknowledgement of their sins should be followed by that despair of pardon, which of old seized the mind of Cain and of Judas, both of whom looked on God solely as an avenger and punisher, forgetting that he is also mild and merciful. In this petition, therefore, we ought to be so disposed that acknowledging our sins in the bitterness of our souls, we may fly to God as to father, a father, not as to a judge imploring him to deal with us, not according to his justice, but according to his mercy. We shall be easily induced to acknowledge our sins if we listen to God himself admonishing us through the sacred scriptures in this regard. Thus we read in David, they are all gone aside. They are become unprofitable together. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Solomon speaks to the same purpose. There is no just man upon earth that doth good and sinneth not. To this subject apply also these words. Who can say, my heart is clean, I am pure from sin. The very same has been written by St. John to deter men from arrogance. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Jeremiah also says, Thou hast said, I am without sin and am innocent, and therefore let thy anger be turned away from me. Behold, I will contend with thee in judgment, because thou hast said, I have not sinned. 
Christ the Lord, who spoke by the mouth of all these, confirms their teaching by this petition in which he commands us to confess our sins. The council of Melevi forbids us to interpret it otherwise. It hath pleased the council that whosoever will have it that these words of the Lord's prayer forgive us. Our debts are sent by holy men in humility, not in truth, let him be anathema. For who can endure a person praying and lying not to men, but to the Lord himself, saying with the lips that he desires to be forgiven, but with the heart that he has no debts to be forgiven? Sorrow for man, sorrow for sin. In making this necessary acknowledgement of our sins, it is dot enough to call them to mind lightly, for it is necessary that the recollection of them be bitter, that it touch the heart and pierce the soul and imprint sorrow. Wherefore the pastor should treat this point diligently, that his pious hearers may not only recollect their sins and iniquities, but recollect them with pain and sorrow, to that with true in interior contrition they may betake themselves to God their Father, humbly imploring him to pluck from the soul the piercing strings of sin. Motives for sorrow over sin, the baseness of sin. Pa the pastor, however, should not be content with placing before the eyes of the faithful the turpitude of sin. He should also depict the unworthiness and baseness of men who, though nothing but rottenness and corruption, dare to outrage in a manner beyond belief, all belief, the incomprehensible majesty and ineffable excellence of God, particularly ever after having been created, redeemed, and enriched by him with countless and invaluable benefits, the consequences of sin, and for what? Only for this, that separating ourselves from God our Father, who is the supreme good and lured by the most base rewards of sin, we may devote ourselves to the devil to become his most wretched slaves. Language is inadequate to depict the cruel tyranny which the devil exercises over those who, having been shaken off the sweet yoke of God and broken the most lovely bond of charity by which our spirit is bound to God our Father, have gone over to their relentless enemy who is therefore called in Scripture the Prince and Ruler of the world, the Prince of Darkness, and King over all the children of pride, truly to those who are oppressed by the tyranny of the devil, apply these words of Isaiah, O Lord, our God, other lords besides thee have had dominion over us. If these broken covenants of love do not move us, let at least the calamities into which we fall by sin move us. The sanctity of the soul is violated, which we know to have been wedded to Christ. That temple of the Lord is profaned against the contaminators of which the apostle utters this denunciation. If any man violate the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Innumerable are the evils brought upon man by sin, that almost infinite pest of which David says, There is no health in my flesh because of thy wrath. There is no peace for my bones because of my sins. In these words he marks the violence of the plague, confessing that it left no part of him uninfected by the pestiferous sin, for he poison had penetrated into his bones, that is, it infected his understanding and will, which are the most intimate faculties of the soul. This widespread pestilence, the sacred scriptures point out when they designate sinners as the lame, the deaf, the blind, the dumb, the paralyzed. But besides the anguish which he felt on account of the enormity of his sins, David was afflicted yet more by the acknowledge, by the knowledge that he had provoked the wrath of God against him by his sin. For the wicked are at war with God, who is offended beyond belief at their crimes. Hence the apostle says, wrath and indignation, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that worketh 
evil. Although the sinful act is transient, yet the sin by its guilt and stain remains, and the imminent wrath of God pursues it as the shadow does the body. When, therefore, David was pierced by these tormenting thoughts, he was moved to seek the pardon of his sins that the pain the faithful imitating the prophet may learn to grieve that is to become truly penitent and cherish the hope of pardon the pastor should call to their attention the example of david's penitential sorrow and the lessons of instruction drawn from his 50th psalm how great is the utility of this sort of instruction which teaches us to grieve for our sins. God himself declares by the mouth of Jeremiah, who when exhorting to the exhorting the Israelites to repentance, admonished them to awake to a sense of the evils that follow upon sin. See, he says, that it is an evil and a bitter thing for thee to have left the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not with thee, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, they who lack this necessary sense of acknowledgement and grief are said by the prophets Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah to have a hard heart, a stony heart, a heart of adamant, for like stone they are softened by no sorrow, having no sense of life that is of the salutary recognition of their sinfulness. Confidence in God's mercy, but less the faithful terrified by the grievousness of their sins, despair of being able to obtain pardon, the pastor ought to encourage them to hope by the following considerations. As is declared in an article of the Creed, Christ the Lord has given power to the church to remit sins. Furthermore, in this petition, our Lord has taught how great is the goodness and bounty of God towards mankind. For if God were not ready and prepared to pardon penitence, their sins, never would he have prescribed this formula of prayer. Forgive us our trespass. Wherefore, we ought to be firmly convinced that since he commands us in this petition to implore his paternal mercy, he will not fail to bestow it on us. For this petition assuredly implies that God is so disposed toward us as willingly to pardon those who are truly penitent. God it is against whom, having cast off obedience, we sin the order of whose wisdom we disturb as far as in us lies, whom we offend, whom we outrage by words and deeds. But it is also God, our most beneficent Father, who having it in his power to pardon all transgressions, has not only declared his willingness to do so, but has also obliged men to ask him for pardon and has taught in what words they are to do so. To no one, therefore, can it be a matter of doubt that under God, his guidance, it is in our power to be reconciled to God. And as this declaration of the divine willingness to pardon increases faith, nurtures hope, and inflames charity, it will be worthwhile to amplify this subject by citing some scriptural authorities and some examples of penitents to whom God granted pardon of the most grievous crimes, since, however, in the introduction to the Lord's Prayer and in that portion of the Creed which teaches the forgiveness of sins, we were as diffuse on the subject as circumstances allowed. The pastor will borrow from those places whatever may seem pertinent for instruction on this point for the rest drawing on the fountains of the sacred scriptures. Debts. The pastor should also follow the same plan which we thought should be used in the other petitions. Let him explain then what the word debts here signifies, lest perhaps the faithful deceived by its ambiguity pray for something different from what should be prayed for. First then we are to know that we by means ask for exemption from the debt we owe to God. 
on so many accounts, the payment of which is essential for salvation, namely that of loving him with our whole heart, our whole soul, and our whole mind. Neither do we ask to be in future exempt from the duties of obedience, worship, veneration, or any other similar obligation comprised also under the word debts. What we do ask is that he may deliver us from sins. This is the interpretation of St. Luke, who instead of debts, makes use of the word sins. Because uh, by their commission, we become guilty before God and incur a debt of punishment, which we must pay either by satisfaction or by suffering. It was of this debt that Christ the Lord spoke by the mouth of his prophet, then did I pay that which I did, I took not away. From these words of God, we may understand that we are not only debtors, but also unequal to the payment of our debt. The sinner, being of himself utterly incapable of making satisfaction, wherefore we must fly to the mercy of God, and as justice, of which God is most tenacious, is an equal and corresponding a tribute to mercy we must make use of prayer and the intercession of the passion of our lord jesus christ without which no one ever obtained the pardon of his sins and from which as from its source have flown all the efficacy and virtue of satisfaction for as such value is that price paid by christ the lord on the cross and communicated to us through the sacraments received either actually or in purpose and desire that it obtains and accomplishes for us the pardon of our sins which is the object of our prayer in this petition here we pardon not only our venial offenses for which pardon may most easily be obtained but also for grievous and mortal sins with regard to grave sins however this petition cannot procure forgiveness unless it derive that efficacy from the sacrament of penance received as we have already said either actually or at least in desire our the word our debts are used here in a sense entirely different from that in which we said our bread that bread is ours because it is given us by the munificence of God whereas sins are ours because with us rests their guilt they are our voluntary acts otherwise they would not have the character of sin admitting therefore and confessing the guilt of our sins we implore the clemency of God which is necessary for their expiation in this we make use of no palliation whatever nor do we transfer the blame to others as did our parents Adam and Eve we judge ourselves employing if we are wise the prayer of the prophet incline not my heart to evil words to make excuses in sins forgive us nor do we say forgive me but forgive us because the fraternal relationship and charity which subsists between all men demand of each of us that being solicitous for the salvation of all our neighbors we pray also for them while offering prayers for ourselves this manner of praying uh, taught by Christ the Lord and subsequently received and always retained by the Church of God the apostles most strictly observed themselves and taught others to observe of this ardent zeal and earnestness in praying for the salvation of our neighbors we have the splendid example of Moses in the Old and of St. Paul in the New Testament the former besought God thus either forgive them this trespass or if thou does not strike me out of the book that thou hast written while the latter prayer after this manner I wished myself to be anathema from Christ for my brethren as we forgive our debtors the word as we may as may be understood in two senses it may be taken as having the force of a comparison meaning that we beg of God to pardon us our sins just as we pardon the wrongs and 
contumelies which we receive from those by whom we have been injured. It may also be understood as denoting a condition. And in this, this sense, Christ the Lord interprets that formula. If he says, you forgive men their offenses, your heavenly Father also forgive you your offenses. But if, we, if you will not forgive men, neither will your Father forgive you your sins. Either sense, however, equally contains the necessity of forgiveness, intimating as it does that if we desire that God should grant us the pardon of our offenses, we ourselves must pardon those from whom we have received injury. For so rigorously does God exact from us forgetfulness of injuries and mutual affection and love that he rejects and despises the gifts and sacrifices of those who are not reconciled to one another. Necessity of forgiveness. Even the law of nature requires that we conduct ourselves towards others as we would have conduct themselves towards us. Hence, he would be most impudent who would ask of God the pardon of his own offenses while he continued to cherish enmity against his neighbor. Those, therefore, on whom injuries have been afflicted should be ready and willing to pardon, urge to it as they are by this form of prayer and by the command of God in St. Luke in thy brother's sin against thee, reprove him, and if he repent, forgive him, and if he sin against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, turn again to thee and say, I repent, forgive him. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, we read, love your enemies, and the apostle, and before him, Solomon wrote, if thy enemy be hungry, give him to eat, if he be thirst, if he thirst, give him to drink, and finally, we read, in the Gospel of St. Mark, when you shall stand to pray, forgive if you have anything against any man, that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your sins. Reasons for forgiveness. But since, on account of the corruption of nature, there is nothing which man brings himself more reluctantly than to pardon of injuries, let pastors exert all the powers and resources of their minds to change and bend the dispositions of the faithful to this mindful and mercy so necessary to let a, to a Christian. Let them dwell on those passages of scripture in which we hear God commanding to pardon enemies. Let them also insist to, on this certain truth that one of the surest signs of men our children of God is their willingness to forgive injuries and sincerely love their enemies for in loving their enemies there shrines forth in us some likeness of God our father who by the death of his son ransomed from everlasting perdition and reconciled to himself the human race which before was most unfriendly and hostile to him let the close of this exhortation and injunction be the command of Christ the Lord, which, without utter disgrace and ruin, we cannot refuse to obey. Pray for them that persecute and calumniate you, that you may be the children of your Father who is in heaven. This petition should not be neglected. But in this matter, no ordinary prudence is required on the part of the pastor, lest Knowing the difficulty and necessity of this precept, anyone despair of salvation. Those unable to forget injuries. There are those who are uh, aware that they ought to bury injuries in voluntary oblivion and ought to love those that injure them, desire to do so, and do so as far as they are able, but feel that they cannot efface from their mind all recollection of injuries, for there lurk in the mind some remains of private grudge in consequence of such persons are disturbed by misgivings of conscience, fearing that they have not in simplicity and frankness laid aside their enmities and consequently do not obey the command of God. Here, therefore, the pastor should explain the 
contrary desires of the flesh and of the spirit, that the former is prone to revenge, the latter ready to pardon. That hence a continual struggle and conflict goes on between them. And wherefore he should point out that although the appetites of corrupt nature are ever opposing and rebelling against reason, we are not on this account to be uneasy regarding salvation, provided the spirit persevere in the duty and disposition of forgiving injuries and of loving our neighbor, those who do not love their enemies. There may be some who, because they have not yet been able to bring themselves to forget injuries and to love their enemies and are, are consequently deterred by the condition contained in this petition from making use of the Lord's Prayer. To remove from their minds this pernicious error, the pastor should adduce the two following considerations. In the first, whoever belongs to the number of the faithful offers this prayer in the name of the entire church in which there must necessarily be some pious persons who have forgiven their debtors the debts here mentioned. Secondly, when we when we ask this favor from God, we also ask for whatever cooperation with the petition is necessary on our part in order to obtain the object of our prayer. Thus we ask the pardon of our sins and the gift of true repentance. We pray for the grace of inward sorrow and we beg that we may be able to abhor our sins and confess them truly and piously to the priest since then it is necessary for us to forgive those who have inflicted on us any injury any loss when we ask pardon of god we beg of him at the same time to grant us grace to be reconciled to those against whom we harbor hatred those therefore who are troubled by that groundless and perverse fear that by this prayer they provoke still more the wrath of God should be undeceived and should be exhorted to make frequent use of a prayer in which they beseech God our Father to grant them the disposition to forgive those who have injured them and to love our enemies. How to make this petition fruitful penitential dispositions. But that this petition may be really fruitful, we should first seriously reflect that we are suppl suppliants before God's listening from him pardon, which is not granted, but to the penitent. And that we should therefore be animated by that charity and piety, which are fitting in penitents, whom it eminently becomes to keep before our eye, their eyes, as it were, their own crimes and enormities, and to expiate them with tears. Avoidance of dangers of sin. To this thought should be joined caution in guarding for the future against every occasion of sin and against whatever I may, I may expose us to the danger of offending God our Father with this solicitude. The mind of David was occupied when he said, my sin is always before me, and every night I will wash my bed, I will water my couch with my tears. Imitation of fervent penitence. Let each one also call to mind the ardent love of prayer of those who obtain from God through their entreaties the pardon of such sins. Such was the publican who, standing afar off through shame and grief and with eyes fixed on the ground, only smote his breast crying, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Such was also the woman, a sinner, who, standing behind Christ the Lord, washed his feet, wiped them with her hair and kissed them. Lastly, there is the example of Peter, the prince of the apostles, who, going forth, wept bitterly. Frequent use of the sacraments. They should next consider that the weaker men and the more liable to diseases of the soul, which are sins, the more numerous and frequent are the remedies they need. Now the remedies of a sick soul are penance and the Eucharist. 
These, therefore, should the faithful frequently make use of. Alms deeds. Next, alms deeds, as the sacred scripture declare, are a medicine suited to heal the wounds of the soul. Wherefore, let those who desire to make pious use of this prayer act kindly to the poor according to their means of the great efficacy of alms in effacing the stains of sin. The angel of the Lord in Tobias, Holy Raphael, is a witness who says, Alms deliver from death, and the same is that which purgeth away sins and maketh to find mercy in life everlasting. Daniel is another witness who thus admonished King Nebuchadnezzar, Redeem thou thy sins with alms and thy iniquities with works of mercy for the poor. The spirit of forgiveness, the best alms, and the most excellent act of mercy is forgetfulness of injuries and goodwill towards those who have injured us or ours in person, in property, or in character. Whoever, therefore, desires to experience in a special manner the mercy of God should make an offering to God himself in all his enmities, remit every offense, and pray for his enemies with the greatest goodwill, seizing every opportunity of doing them good. But as this subject was explained when we treated of murder, we refer the pastor to that place. The pastor ought to conclude his explanation of this petition with his final, this final reflection that nothing is or can be conceived more unjust than that he who is so rigorous towards men as to extend indulgence to no one should himself demand that God be mild and kind towards him.